This is lecture 14 of ECE 5312. And so what we're going to do in this lecture is now, so lecture 13, we went on and on and on and on about the Bayes rule. We talked about decision rules. We talked about ML and map detectors. We talked about likelihood functions and log likelihood functions. So I just, just threw tons of math at you. And you're like, Whoo, just like, you know, the tsunami of math, right? It could be worse. But no, just kidding. Later. So what happens is today, what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to look at specifically the AWGN channel. So remember what I, like, you know, I think some of you asked, because it's been a while since you've taken probability, and you say, well, I noticed probability and random processes is a prerequisite for this course. What do we need of it? Like, you know, it, do we need Poisson processes? Do we need to know about that? Markov chains? Um, 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 wide sense stationary, strict sense stationary, do we need any of that? And in an, you know, to, 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 to be honest, what you really need, everything else can be self-taught, but the one thing you absolutely need from all probabilities, the one thing you need is knowing how to deal with Gaussian random variables. And the reason is, is that this is where Gaussian random variables come in. The performance analysis that we're going to be conducting is entirely in Gaussian random variables. Now, this does not mean that there are no wireless channels out there that have other sort of random distributions to dictate how that noise is distributed, right? But for the most part, well, if you can do it with Gaussian, you can definitely do it with all the others. Okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the AWGN channel. So let's, let's draw that forward. So, uh, better switch into computer mode. Okay. So what we saw in the last lecture, so from lecture 13. Is that we have a vector model where we transmit SK, we add noise, and then the receiver Pick, observes, so here's my weird attempt at drawing an eye. I, I saw this always in physics, right? So here's your eye. Well, let's make it freaky, right? Let's see, let, let, let it like shoot lasers or something. Do, 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 do. Okay. So it is observing rho at the receiver, right? So it's like saying, oh, we got rho. We observed this, okay? Now, let's take this one step further. This guy here until now has been mystery random variable x or actually n, right? And it's not a variable, it's a vector. What we're going to do now is, that's AWGN. Yay. So what, just for sake of defining what AWGN is, it is additive, white, Gaussian, noise. And what we know about this vector, when we have a vector n, and it's a Gaussian random vector, is that it's going to have a PDF that is going to be jointly Gaussian across n dimensions, right? So let's say, again, I'm, I'm very, I draw very poor diagrams beyond three dimensions, but let's say we take a two-dimensional Gaussian random vector. How is it going to look like? Right? So let's say that's dimension, that's n1, that's element n1, and this is element n2. It will look like this. And remember what I was saying about whether it is correlated or not. If it's not correlated, which means independence just for Gaussians, right? Any other random variable doesn't have that property where uncorrelatedness means independence. What happens is, if it's uncorrelated, we have this beautiful symmetric dome. And if it's not, if it is correlated, it looks like it's squished along a specific axis. It shows that depending on what pairing of N1 and N2 you have, you actually have some sort of, you have a dependency. Basically, the choice of N1 will dictate, uh, and N2 will have a completely different uh, sort of property uh, compared to two other pairings of N1 and N2 somewhere else. It will not have that uniform shape in three dimensions. 
And then, of course, if we go into, let's say, n1, n2, n3, I can't draw that. That's like hyper surfaces and, and such. I don't. So, so what happens is now this lecture. So let's recap. What what did we? What was the punchline from the last lecture, from lecture 13? So the punchline is that we have a decision rule based on observing rho at the input to the receiver, the probability that SK was transmitted, given, well, let's say that SK was, we want that probability based on, on the observation to be greater than saying that the probability that SI was transmitted based on our observation of rho occurs. And then we saw from this that we can use mixed Bayes rule, mixed Bayes rule, that we can actually express as the PDF of rho given SK times the probability of SK over the PDF of rho. And then what we saw is this actually does not contribute because if we then try and do the max of SK, right? And that means the max of SK there. This guy has no SK in him. And then what happens is we have two flavors. We had ML and we had MAP, maximum a posteriori. So that was confirmed, um, which means that in, in this guy's case, what does, what does MAP mean? What well, means that we have max SK the PDF of rho given SK times the probability of SK, which means that this guy might have, you know, the, each SK uh, might have a specific uh, probability that might not be equal to another. So they're not equally likely. And the ML, the maximum likelihood, assumes that they are, right? So w uh, we just say they're all equally likely to occur. So from that, what we want to do now is, okay, if you notice, the, the theme here is what, how do we get these PDFs? So the probability of the symbol being transmitted, that is an observation of the type of data that we're, the type of symbols that were, and the characteristic of our transmitter and the data and the information source and all those things combined together. But the PDF, that, folks, is tied to noise. And you might say, okay, how? So let's, let's revisit something. So, well, I'm going to move the mouse here. So, so remember, let's say we have a noise vector n. Oh, and it's red because it's mad, okay? And so we have the noise vector n. And, okay, well, let me delete that. And so what we want to do is, um, what, is the P, what, is the joint, what is the joint PDF? So let's say we have that, you know, across all those n values. And that's going to be equal to what? Any thoughts? If this is uncorrelated noise, right? And the dimensions are uncorrelated. Well, well first of all, um, what, what, so first of all, what, what, what should we have? So we saw from several classes ago, if, if each one of these guys, so n here consists of n1, n2, n3, all the way to nm. So it's m-dimensional space, right? What should the joint PDF of this look like? Mm -hmm. so, so if they're in the, each one of these elements are independent of each other, right? What we saw is that this should be, um, I'm trying to recall this from memory, right? And then this would be m over 2, right? e minus the, 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 the mean, uh, sorry, um, yeah, the, the, magnit the, the magnitude squared of n the vector, we're assuming zero mean here, right? Divided by sigma squared. So this... Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we're making the assumption, 
Asam Shon. That this is I I D. I E. Oh, so all these like different acronyms. Identically and independently distributed. Okay? So this beautiful relationship here is going to be very super duper handy. Also, my choice of red ink, I, I almost think of like the horror film. It's like, yes. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> sorry. My, my wife would get a kick out of that. So she loves horror films. Okay. Now, so how is this helpful? So uh, there's, some, there's some stuff in the slides, but I don't think I art articulated them very clearly in the slides, so that's why I'm, I'm go working through this right now. What happens is, remember our vector channel model, right? We have SK, we have R, we have N. And we know that R is equal to SK plus N. Or, just because I want to like cut this in many different ways, N is equal to R minus SK. Okay? Now, this is actually kind of important. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the following. So I'm going to take this, and what you'll find is um, is if we use a conditional PDF, right? So let's say we take that PDF of what? Of rho given SK. What it turns out, okay? What it turns out that this guy here, in fact, um, if you notice that this, uh, first of all, it should, this should be rho. Ah, I'm just killing everything. Sorry. So th here's rho. That's n. That's rho. So what it turns out is that this guy here, I mentioned this before. How does he look like? If it was a Gaussian. Right? And it has a mean. And it turns out that that mean, okay, in, in sort of a weird vector way, so let's say we have to choose a dimension because this is n-dimensional, but it will have a mean. And that mean will be influenced by whatever element of SK is applied in that dimension. So if you have two-dimensional, you're going to have two Gaussians, and they're both going to be shoved. They're going to be shifted based on what that SK element at I or J or K is. So what ends up happening is it's kind of interesting. What does this look like? This is n. This is like n, but hmm. what it will turn out is that th that conditional PDF will actually be equal to 1 over, right, if it's m dimensional, e to the minus, now what is the expression if we had a non-zero mean? Rho minus SK divided by 2 sigma squared. Yes? I think it should be N plus SK. Okay, why? Because this is a priority of R given SK, so we set this N mm -hmm. by SK. That's all what we get. So it adds to the vector of N, the, the, the vector of U. Mm -hmm. Okay, so rho minus sk is basically n. So that's correct. So what happened? Okay, so the question is, this should be rho plus sk. No, n plus sk. N plus sk. Okay. Okay. So the question is, this should be n plus sk. Um, okay. So that's a good question. What happens is, what we're literally doing is we're plugging into n what it's equal to. So like literally the expression that I had before, which was what is n equal to? Rho m minus sk, which I simply took and transplanted 
into the expression there in order to yield that. And it turns out that you might, okay, so, so right now what I'm doing, so this is a great question. So what happens is the first thing I do is I observe this and say this is the expression for zero mean noise, right? And so rho minus the bias gives me that zero mean noise, right? So what happens is we can plug that into the expression up here. Now, what happens is it's kind of interesting because rho is random, right? But it's dependent, like this, this rho minus sk is dependent on what sk is transmitted. So now what happens is we essentially translate in this into, we have a distribution rho, but it's conditioned on the sk. So this is an excellent point. So you might say, OK, how, how come, like, you know, should be n minus that? And the, the answer is that that's if you want to just get pure rho. But what we want, so let's say if we want to know what the PDF of rho is. We want to know what is the PDF of rho given sk. Oh, I'm sorry, but I yep. guess even with given sk, mm -hmm. uh, when we subtract sk from rho, mm -hmm. rho is not conditioned on sk anymore because it will always be n no matter what. If, if for any x, it will always be n. Okay, so the, the, so the question is, um, regard, so you're saying regardless, so, so basically when we do the, the rho, it, it, it's independent of sk? Okay. Uh, But that's, a, that's a, at a later point. But I mean, so let's say for a given SK, so I print SK. Mm -hmm. And now we got SK plus N. Mm -hmm. So it should be the same distribution as N, but shifted by SK. And that's equal to rho. And that's equal to rho. So, so, what hap so, 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 so what happens is we get rho by taking SK plus N, which is correct. Right. Is we know for sure what the PDF, the joint PDF of N is. So what happens is by doing a change of variables, we now have in terms of sk and of rho, which is the only thing we observe. We don't observe n. We have now just the observed, which is rho, and we have the advanced knowledge of what sk looks like for all sk. And from that, fitting it into a distribution for n, which uh, what the noise distribution should be, we can actually formulate things in terms of what the observed is. So, so you're absolutely right. Like, you know, we, we can... Like, we can structure this any which way, but the problem is we don't know what n is, right? Unless we transmit nothing and only observe it in silent periods and such. If we have an observation and the observation contains some symbol plus noise, then this is the alternative. Essentially, it's a type of signal subtraction. So you have received signal with noise. If you, and this makes a huge assumption on synchronization here. So what happens is if you take the SK and you know what the SK is and subtract it off, you should be left with the noise. And then we know what the PDF is. So this is a way of working backwards to get what is the distribution of that row minus the SK and should be equal to N. So, now that, that, that's, so, so that's where I'm coming from. So you're absolutely right. It's just that we're working it from the angle of we, we know what the distribution of the noise is, but we, we, we can't, we're not observing the noise. We're observing a row at the receiver. So that's an excellent question. Excellent question. So, and that, that's why we're, like, you know, we, we, we rewrite this. We take the n, and we know this expression, but we're observing this, and my receiver also knows this. It has to know this. So those are the only things we do know at the receiver. And so those are the things we plug back in to give us this expression. And then we know that this, in fact, is going to be the distribution. This is going to be the distribution. Like, if you look at the structure, what does the new PDF tell me? It is, so if we rewrite this, which is this guy here, thank goodness. This guy here, it tells me I have a row, right? And it has a mean. SK, which makes sense. So it actually shifts. It, uh, the, the, the SK part tells me that there, there is a mean, this guy is a deterministic sort of bias that shifts the mean off to wherever SK is. And, and rho is your random variable, right? Perfect, perfect. And what happens is, at the same time, the variance, what, the, the, which is uh, related to the power of that noise, is still embedded in this, this expression, right? Perfect. Thank you. So given all of this, now if we go to the slides,
what happens is, given this premise, so it took me a while to develop it. So what ends up happening, we get this math, right? And so that's where, how do we get this? Now, you guys know how to got it. I got it. Ooh, bad English. <laughs> what happens is, the reason why is, is like that punchline at the end. This guy here. And what happens is, just like what we discussed before, you know, the, the, the AWGN vector is uncorrelated, right? Like, you know, because we are assuming it's IID. So when it's IID, we can then assume it's independent. And what a joint PDF decomposes into marginal PDFs that are all multiplied together, right? And then that, what happens, means that your vector representation, if you do, if you find out what the marginal PDF for a single element in that Gaussian vector is, it will be, essentially, it will come out to be to this guy, the, the norm squared of the vector subtraction between rho and si, and then in an exponent, okay? So you might say, okay, cool, right? Okay, how do I use that? <laughs> okay, so if we go back, boop, boop. If we go back to this guy, you might say, okay, so I've got this. Now what? So remember my, look, let's say we use, we, we just go back to the max SK. PDF, row, SK, probability, SK, right? This guy now, and that's going to be equal to E to the minus row minus SK. So does everyone see where that came from? So what, what I essentially did is the reason why I had to play that little trick, this guy here. So remember my channel model. So this should always be on the side. So that's SK, that's N, and that's rho. Whoop. What happens is this guy here, because we have N is equal to rho minus SK, I can rewrite it as such. Now, let's let's do the recall, and I don't mean total recall. Okay, so and the recall is log likelihood. Okay, and so what we want to do is we want to take the natural logarithm of this expression. Why? Because um, the PDF. Is positive value, so we won't run into any nasty issues with logs of negative values. Second, log functions, log functions are uh, monotonic, which means that there's a one-to-one -one mapping, i.e. So if we have this sort of setup, what do we do now? So let's take the natural, we, we, what we do is we take this guy, and what we do is if we take the natural logarithm, remember that, just on, as an aside, we care about the relative Max. We don't care about the we don't care about the absolute value. All we care about is who is the maximum. We don't care about by how much. We just care who's the max, right? So we if we take the natural log of this guy, Yeah. Okay. 
So now what happens is, what happens when you take the natural logarithm of this? First of all, what, when you have the lo natural logarithm of the product of stuff, you can break it out into the log, uh, the sum of the log of the individual guys. Ah. And then what happens is, does this term mean anything in terms of the max? No. Actually, why, why not use the art of digital, right? There we go. Ha, ha, ha. Now, here's the fun part. That exponential bothered me because until now, I was worried that I had to deal with a receiver that was nonlinear. I'm going to have an exponential. Right? Natural log of the expon exp 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 exponential of this argument now nicely becomes. So let's actually, before I. Let's, let, what happens is essentially that counteracts each other. So what we end up getting is minus rho minus sk squared divided by 2 sigma squared. And then let's bring this guy over here. Plus natural log of the probability of s of k, right? So what I've just done is, so I have this pesky guy here, right? But what's really nice is that this guy here, this is now a linear function, right? It's a distance metric, and I don't have to worry about the exponent. This is, very, very, this is a very important result. It even gets better. Does that 2 sigma ma matter? No, nah, not really. We can always dump it. We can, we c what we can do is, let me choose the right sides this time. What we can do is we can actually multiply it by this guy here, right? So what we're doing in the end is we're dumping everything until we get this beautiful result in the red box. And the reason for that is vector-wise, we saw this, right? So this is the noise. This displacement. This is a vector subtraction from the, let's say, a vector and what we receive, the received vector. And it's displaced by And what, what happens is, so it's maximum s of k and then the norm squared of this vector subtraction plus some stuff, right? So the natural logarithm of the probability of s k times 2 sigma squared, right? And this guy is like, you know, this, this is just a probability function. This is a characteristic of the traffic. But what's interesting, what's interesting is this guy here. Because what, what happens is, what is the maximum of a negative number? It's going to be the minimum of the positive. So I can rewrite this. SK. Okay, and so what happens is, imagine if this is maximum likelihood, an ML. This guy here is, would be a constant and has no SK, and we would just say bye bye, we would, and then we would only have that. So let's let's say we take that one step further. So what you end up getting, let's let's assume. Assume ML. What you end up getting is that this guy is now going to become min SK So you might say, okay Let's take our friend QPSK So let's say we have a signal here a signal constant Vector wise that's S1, S2, S3, S4. Okay? 
Now suppose I observe this. What does this decision rule mean if we have ML? What this tells me, there we go. What this tells me is, okay, it says who has the smallest distance squared. In fact, I can get rid of the square. Because again, square, uh, like, you know, uh, what happens is we're taking the norm. We're taking the distance, right? So um, as assuming that this is going to be a positive value, we can get rid of the square. The square just mag magnifies whether we have a minimum or a maximum. What this guy is here is it's, it's a distance metric. We're trying to minimize the distance. Find the nearest neighbor. Nearest neighbor to rho. So who's the nearest? Well, this guy. He has the smallest distance. Because this guy here, no. This guy here, absolutely not. He's not the smallest. And this guy here. And you might say, remember that decision rule where the probability of sk uh, given rho is greater than or equal to the probability of si given rho? And there's that equal sign. So remember, so it's like greater than or equal to. So one conditional probability and another. That, unfortunately, folks, is when you got a tie. When you're right in the middle between two. It does happen, in which case, get a quarter, boop, and choose, right? And it's 50-50 at that point. So what, so in the end, if you have an ML detector, what your detector is essentially is in the vector space, is saying, who is the nearest signal constellation point, the signal constellation vector, S, I, or which, whichever, to rho. And it turns out that that is the optimal when you have AWGN. Right? So let's, let's dig into the slide because there's a lot more detail there. I just wanted to play with the colors, though. OK. So what happens is we have this. And so in case you don't believe me in terms of mon monotonicity, this is what your natural logarithm function looks like. Monotonic, right? So essentially it's gradually increasing and it's a one-to-one -one mapping all the way along. So if x2 is greater than x1 or equal to x1, then ln of x2 is greater than or equal to ln of x1. So if we take the natural logarithm, what you end up getting, and this here is the ML case, right? So what ends up happening is you have all that math, and in the end, ta-da, you have that thing. And notice that I left out the square here because, again, what happens if you have the smallest possible value squared versus the next smallest possible value squared? Relativistically speaking, bless you, what happens is relativistically speaking, the smallest value is still the smallest value, just as squared, right? So this here is our decision rule, right? So, I brought up that QPSK example. I know, I, I sort of like jumping ahead. And so remember that we don't care so much about the maximum value. We care about the argument that yields the maximum value. And in this case, it's the minimum value, so we do the argmin. We find the argument that yields the minimum value for this expression. And the way we interpret it is like a distance. So when we talk about like Euclidean distance, this, what happens is whenever we talk about distance of anything, you can graphically represent it in this type of space. In this case, in the signal constellation space, we can describe each one of these signal constellation points. And you know, the square, square root of their energy dictates you know, what their i and q, their in-phase and quadrature, their real and imaginary contributions are. And then we receive this signal and say, who is it near to? And so intuitively, we all say, yeah, it makes sense, right? If we get rho. And it looks like it's very close. Like, you know, you and I, we can say, yeah, I think out of all those vectors, I think S1 is the closest row. Tell that to a computer. So how does a computer understand this? Distance, give me D. You know, so what happens is you say, here's the vector, here's the vector, put it in MATLAB. You, you, you can't say, MATLAB, tell me who's closer. MATLAB say, does not compute. Or um, if you type the word Y, you get something really funny, right? So like, if you really want to kill time, just type Y in MATLAB a few hundred times, and you know, you'll see the sense of humor that they have with the math works. Now, um, but in reality, we need to give a mathematical, a quantitative expression for our receiver to say, aha, it's S1. 
And this is how you do it. Use distance. Okay? So that's for the ML. Now, let's dig a little deeper. Th because the thing is, OK, computer might say, so th this, is, this is the part in, in me that says, OK, um, mathematically, we have this expression. But how do we create a communication system that does it? So software-defined radio, you know, sure, you know, you can write a function and stuff. But in the end, we have to have some sort of treatment of signals in order to make the decision. So what we want to do is we want to create a receiver based on some basic building blocks that everyone uses. So I'm gonna, again, I'm going to sort of just use the whiteboard mainly because I, I think this is actually kind of useful. So let's go back to this guy here. Ah. OK, so I'm intentionally keeping this guy here. Let's, let's, go, let's actually go back to the square. And what I want to do is expand it out. So if I do this, what do I have? So I have row. And so what is the norm squared? Dot product, vector dot product, right? So that's going to be equal to that thing dot that thing, right? Which is equal to row dot row, okay? And then minus row dot sk, then minus sk dot row, and then plus sk dot sk. What are some interesting things about this? Energy of sk, right? Um, how about this guy? This is some sort of correlation. In fact, let's, what are these two guys? This is going to be 2 sk dot rho. This is some sort of, I'm going to use this, um, sorry, I really like doing that. This is essentially a correlator. You might ask, how is that a correlator? This is how. You're taking sk, the vector. And here is rho, the vector. What I'm doing is I'm projecting, uh, uh, or actually should be the other way around, but I'm essentially projecting one vector onto another. I'm basically trying to see how much of one vector is contained in the other, the correlation. All right. So this guy is a correlator. Now, this guy is kind of interesting here too. So this is some sort of energy of rho. Does it have sk in it? No. So what ends up happening is that our min sk is going to be equal to sk, sorry, ah, it's going to be equal to e sk, the energy of sk, minus 2 sk dot rho. Now, um, I'm going to redo this again, but I'm going to use max. sk, 2 sk dot rho minus the energy. Maybe even better yet, for the sake of simpli simplifying my life, 1 half e sk. OK? So you might say, OK, how do I realize this? And this is how you realize it. So let's switch over to. So all that stuff, all that math I've done. If you go into the waveform domain, this is what you, you would essentially realize. Waveform domain. So what you would do is there are several blocks. So the first thing you would do is you would take the waveform SK, and you would multiply period by period with rho. Then what you do is remember how you do correlation in the waveform domain. It's one waveform multiplied by another, integrate over the period of t. How would you implement that in the radio? How would you impl in, in, implement that in any sort of radio? Is you would have an integrator. That's what this block is. And then you have this funny sampler. What happens is all we care about, so 
how do you, how is an implement uh, how is an uh, how is a integration actually implemented? It's an accumulator. So you take the, the product of the two signals, you accumulate the values over t, sample at t, and then there's this feedback loop. It's called dump. So this is process is called an integrate and dump. So what you do is every t seconds accumulate accumulate accumulate. You get your value t, sample, reset. So the dump is a reset. You go back to zero, and you accumulate the next period. Reset, next period, reset. And right before you reset, what is the value? So now you have a discrete value. Then, ah, this is my friend. That's the energy. It turns out that if your waveform, and this, think of this intuitively. We want max, right? So, we want, so what happens is if we have, let's say here's rho, and we have this huge si signal energy for sk, right? And then let's say si or some other s has a little bit of energy. It's going to bias things. Try it out. Create your own waveforms. Make one s, very, like full of energy, huge energy, high amplitude, and another one almost no energy. What you find is that that will bias our detector. So what you need to do for each branch. So you might say, okay, why am I doing for each branch? And I'll get to it in a minute. What you want to do is you want to subtract off the energy of the symbol divided by 2, because that's how we did our detector scheme. And what that does is it makes every branch. So every branch here, the way you would do it, and this might sound inefficient, because we don't know which s it is. So what we do is we receive rho, and we feed rho into every possible waveform that it could be, S1, S2, S3, all the way to Sm. And we multiply S1 of t with rho of t during time period t, S2 of t with rho of t at, across time period t, S3 of t times rho t over time period t, all the way to Sm of t times rho of t over period of t. We then do the accumulating, sample at time instant t, reset, so we're ready for the next period. We subtract off the energy bias of every symbol waveform, just to make sure that we have a fair comparison. So it, it's minus. Yes. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. So the, so, uh, the question is, is the, um, the energy, it should be subtracted, yes. I always mess that up. <laughs> it's like, where's the minus? So it should be subtracted. That's a good quiz question. How many people are paying attention? No, don't, don't, don't tell Rashab in the back. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> yes. There should be a minus for each one of these guys. What we're left with is we choose Max, right? We should have, almost have a mascot for this class called Max. And I can imagine Max looking like, I don't know, well, WPI, it's the goat, okay, right? So maybe we should have a So I'm not sure how many people here are artistic. I, I swear it would be a stick figure for me. That should be almost like a bonus question. So what happens is we do this every t seconds. So every symbol period, we do this process, and then it's like, boom, choose max. Who is it? Which index? Which of these branches gives us the largest variable, right? And we do it for every t, and that's how we decode. So it's a combination of correlation to unbiased things, and then we choose a maximum. So that's, that, folks, is how we do the correlator realization of this thing. And that's, that's what sor sort of I described here. So essentially, so the punchline really is, and, and you might say, well, it, it's, it's kind of interesting because what, what, what ends up happening is interpretation, essentially what you're doing is you have to do parallel processing. So you might think, okay, how would I do this? Well, es well essentially what you would need is um, a parallel bank of correlators and then energy subtractors. Right? And so that's, so in some ways it's nice because what happens is, imagine if you're implementing this on an FPGA. 
How much customization do you need to do? None, right? So you build your accumulator block. You build your dump, let's say, circuit. Like, you know, so you implement your integrate and dump using an uh, HDL, right? And then what you do is you cut, paste, cut, paste, cut, paste. So if you have, let's say, 10 possible symbol waveforms, you have to make 10 customized accumulators? No. Simple building block. The waveform, you can have a look for it every symbol period, and then you have a simple multiplier. So you have an array of multipliers. You have an array of cut and pasted integrated and dumps. You have a bunch of subtractors, and then you have a comparator. Right? So that's essentially one implementation. So in this lecture, so in lecture 14, what ends up happening, okay, and, and then there's like a general comment about, about the, the different energies on, on the different branches, but, but, but in this lecture, what we looked at is one type of received structure. So I was telling you guys in lecture 13 that we're going to talk a lot about optimal detection, right? And then here's the application, here's noise. So we take the decision rule that we came up with and the mixed base rule and the log likelihood function and all that. And what we essentially is we've, we've taken all that in the context of an additive white Gaussian noise channel that has IID samples. And we created, you know, we, we did what engineers could do. We can't change the noise, we can't change the transmitter. All we've got is receiver and we made Right here, okay. So that um, that folks concludes um, lecture fourteen. Okay. So while this thing is shutting down, so what we're going to do is we're going to 